Welcome to New Mountain Top Everywhere. I am so excited to share today's broadcast with you. I believe God is going to bless you in a very special way. Be sure to hit that share button, that thumbs up button. Helps us to get spread out so others can find us in the crowded algorithms of YouTube. Hey, make sure you're in the comments. I love to go back and read your comments as we fellowship virtually. There's no church anywhere like New Mountain Top. Get ready to be blessed by God's word today. Oh, this is the day that the Lord has made. Welcome to New Mountain Top. We are so excited to be back in our sanctuary to come to you live. We're excited because as we have moved into this Holy of Holy Weeks, this evening we are celebrating Good Friday. Without Good Friday, there would be no Resurrection Sunday. So Good Friday is a holiday that is celebrated by those of the faithful, commemorating the crucifixion of Jesus and his painful and agonizing death at Calvary. What we know about Good Friday is that had there not been Good Friday, had the prophecies not been fulfilled, there would not be all the excitement of Resurrection Sunday. We know that we love to tell the story that's not how the story ends, but early Sunday morning. But because of Good Friday, Jesus agonized on the cross for six long hours. During the last three hours, the nature would not even respond. The sun would not shine because the sun was on the cross. But Jesus stopped dying long enough to other seven last statements. And the associate ministers of New Mountaintop are going to present those statements to you this evening. I pray that you will be blessed. I pray that there is something that will come forth that will touch your heart. This evening, presenting the seven last statements of Christ while he was yet on the cross is Reverend O'Neill Yates, Minister Siobhan Martin, Reverend Melissa Pope, Minister Taylor Lancaster, Minister Casey Bethel, myself, and Reverend Yates will close us out. Good Friday is a day that we thank the Father for. He sent his only begotten Son, and these are his last seven words on the cross. Out in technology land, truly is a blessing to be in the house of the Lord again. Uh, before I begin with my first word, we will open up in prayer. Oh, gracious Father, rule and make of all things. For God, we come to you because you've been so good to us. And so God, as we think about what you did for us on the cross, and as we talk about all the things that you endured for us, God, God, we just want to say thank you. Because you didn't have to do what you did. At any point in time, you could have called legions of angels, God. At any point in time, God, you could have came down and took care of the matter. But we'd say thank you anyway. God, we ask that the words that come out of our mouths, may they may be a blessing to someone who is in need, God. Right now, this day, right now, this moment, God, bless us in a special way. And when we all said and done, God, may we be a blessing. May you be proud of us and what we're doing. These are the blessings in your son, Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Well, I have the pleasure of doing the first word. And that first word is in Luke 23, 34. It says, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Brothers and sisters, what they did that day was unforgivable. That's the definition of what unforgivable is. When you crucify the Son of God, you've done that which is beyond forgiveness. How do you forgive the unforgivable? How do you forgive someone who has done something to you? So terrible that it defines any attempt at human forgiveness. As we study the remarkable words of Jesus, I will try to equip you for the next time you have to forgive the unforgivable. Here's point number one. Forgiveness is possible when you discover people who hurt you really don't know what they're doing. Well, you may be scratching your head saying, but Reb, you don't understand. They knew exactly what they was doing when they was hurting me. They knew what they was doing when 
before they was even doing it. They knew they were going to hurt me, and yet they went ahead and did it anyway. When they told that lie, they knew what they was doing. When they double-crossed me, they knew what they was doing. When they stepped out on me, they knew what they was doing. When they broke the marriage vows, Reverend, they knew what they was doing. They knew exactly what they was doing, but yet they did it anyway. Now let's consider Jesus. Who are he talking about here when he said, for they know not what they are doing? Who is the day he's talking about? Could the day be the Roman soldiers? Did the Roman soldiers know what they were doing or not? Well, yes, they knew they were crucifying Jesus, but they did not know who he really was. Who else was they? Could it have been Pilate? Did Pilate know what he was doing? Well, Pilate did know. He knew Jesus was called the king of the Jews. And what he knew scared him to the point he tried to wash his hands of it, but he didn't know the whole story. What about Caiaphas? Caiaphas knew that Jesus was called the Son of God, the Messiah. What did Caiaphas do? He said, I want nothing to do with this. Crucify him and get him out of here. Well, you say, what about Judas? Did Judas know what he was doing? He was with Jesus three and a half years. He sold Jesus for 30 pieces of silver. And what about the mob? Were they all guilty? What about the spectators cheering, crucify him, crucify him? Did they all know what they was doing? Yes, they did. But Jesus said, Father, forgive them because they do not know what they're doing. Now, pay up close attention to that word what? Because it is the key to the first saying of Christ from the cross. You see, the key is not the fact that they did not know. The key is what they did not know. They didn't know what they was doing. You see, they knew they were crucifying Jesus, but they didn't know what it really meant. They knew they were crucifying Jesus, but they did not know what the ramifications were. They knew they were crucifying Jesus, but they did not know who they were doing it to. They thought they was just killing a man but they was killing the king of kings and the Lord of lords. You see, when Jesus cried out, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do, basically what he was saying was, Father, forgive them because they're in desperate need of forgiveness and they don't even know it. Do you know how the truth is? You see, we get mad. You see, the same is with people who hurt you. They need forgiveness more than they even know. Why it may be true, yes, they did hurt you. And that hurt did tear you down to your heart. It did hurt you when they left you. They knew exactly what they was doing, but they didn't know the effects of it. They didn't know how bad and how terrible it was. They only knew it on the surface. They didn't know deep down, and they could never know deep down just how bad they hurt you. You see, people who have hurt you, they need forgiveness more than they ever know. They need it more than they know and will ever know. And here's newsflash. They probably will never change. And the sad part is we have to forgive them anyway. You see, that's the deeper meaning of the first word from the cross. You can forgive the unforgettable if you remember that people who have hurt you so deeply don't at the deepest level know what they have really done to you until it's too late. Forgiveness is what they need, and you are the only one who can forgive them. Here's the second point. Forgiveness is possible when you discover that Jesus forgave you when you was unforgivable. You see, this is where the words of Jesus becomes very personal. See, when he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. You know who else was in it? You was. I was. He was praying for you. He was praying for me. See, well, you say, I'm not like those people. I, I'm, I'm different. I, I, I'm not that bad. I'm not the kind of person who would crucify anybody. I'd never do anything like that. Well, guess what? Oh, yes, you will. 
Oh, yes, you would. And you have many times and you will do it again. Do you know what keeps us from forgiving other people who hurts us? At the root of it all, here it is. We think we're better than them. We, we think we would never hurt anybody the way they have hurt us. I'm just not as bad as that. I'd never treat anybody the way they treated me. <laughs> we get mad when we think about we would never hurt or do anything to another person the way that they have hurt us. But here's one thing you need to know. You was dead in your sins. You see, you hadn't always been saved and sanctified and filled with the Holy Ghost. You hadn't always been reverend do right. You see, let the truth be told, Romans 3.23 says, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Do you know what the truth is? We get mad just like they do. We lose our tempers just like they do. We slap our friends just like they do. We crucify our friends just like we do. We break our promises just like they do. We all sinners in our sight of God. You see, we are all fail in one way or another. And here's the third point. Forgiveness is possible when you discover that God loves you. See, John 3.16 says, For God gave so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him shall not perish. Romans 8, 37 and 39, and it's the verses I love. It says, nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that love us. It says, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. You see, here's the bottom line. God loves you. God loves you. God loves you. And there's nothing you can do about it. Make you be blessed. Our selected passage of scripture today is coming from Luke chapter 23, verse 43. And it says, Jesus answered him, truly, I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. I need to let somebody know today that it wasn't the nails that held him to the cross, but it was God's ultimate plan of salvation. You see, Jesus understood the necessity of his assignment, for the Bible says in John 14 and 6 that Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but by me. Even as a child, he informed his mother that I must be about my father's business. He understood that without sacrifice, there could be no salvation. And without the shedding of blood, there would be no remission of sins. Jesus recognized that he wasn't just sent here to live his best life, but he came to prepare a way for eternal life for you and me. Therefore, he laid down his life so that we may be able to live. For the Bible says in John 15 and 13 that greater love hath no man than this, that a man will lay down his life for his friends. I just believe today that his purpose superseded his pain and even the process that he had to go through. Because Isaiah 53 and 3, uh, 5 tells us that he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. That's why he went through the pain. That's why he went through the process. That's why he went through all of the agony that he had to endure. Jesus knew that God sent him here to accomplish a great mandate. And even though people mocked him, and even though they ridiculed him, he had an assignment that he had to complete. Hallelujah. Even though he was tortured, the Bible tells us that he was taunted. He was talked about, abused, and even misunderstood, but he chose to stay right there on the cross. Even though they yelled out to him, if you are the son of God, why don't you come down from the cross and save yourself? But Jesus stayed right there, and he didn't say a mumbling word. He didn't allow their lashing out to cause him to have an identity.
identity crisis. Jesus knew who he was. He didn't even need their validation or even their seal of approval. Hallelujah. Because he could have called down a legion of angels to wipe them all out. But he chose to stay right there on the cross. He didn't allow their words to make him deviate from his purpose. He didn't allow their actions to stop him from completing his divine assignment. Somebody needs to know today that even though other people may not accept you, even though they may not even appreciate you or give you a round of applause or even the accolades that you deserve, don't allow their words to cause you even to deviate from your own purpose and your God-given assignment. I've come to encourage somebody today to stay the course and you fight on. Even though when it seems uncomfortable, even though when it seems unbearable, you need to fight on today. Even though it may seem like you can't handle it and you can't take it anymore, God says that he won't put more on you than what you can bear. Honey, you fight on because the Bible tells us today in Revelation 3, and 11 you hold fast to what you got and let no man take your crown I believe that if my grandmother was here today she would tell you that John 14 and 2 says that in my father's house there are many mansions if it were not so I would have told you I come to prepare a place for you that where I go you may be also I will come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, there you may be also. Somebody ought to begin to praise God today for the ultimate plan of salvation. Somebody ought to begin to praise God today that he stayed on that cross, but he didn't have to. Somebody ought to begin to praise God today that he shed his blood for your sins and mine. He didn't have to do it. But he did. He didn't say a mumbling word, but he died so that we may have life and that we may have it more abundantly. Amen. What a word. Amen. What a word from God. Amen. I'm just so excited about it. I want to thank you so much, sister, for giving the word of God. Amen. I got crunk up in there, and I just want you to know that I'm so grateful. Amen. So grateful that God touched you and gave you the word. Amen. I'm here in the pulpit. Amen. Fired up already. Amen. So I want to thank you, my sister, my sister in Christ. Amen. Thank you. I'm here today to do the third word. Amen. I got super excited about that. Amen. Because I got the third word. Amen. I began to think about that number three. Amen. And I got excited. Amen. Because I began to think about the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. So I got super excited and my spirit got stirred up. You hear what I'm saying? Amen. So then I had to comment on down and hear from the Lord. Amen. So I have the third word. Amen. And I want to read it to you. It's from John. Amen. Chap- beginning in chapter 19, verses 25 through 27. Amen. And it reads like this. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother, and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Cephalus, and Mary Magdalene, verse 26. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he sat upon, he said unto her, his mother, he said, woman, behold thy son, amen, 27. Then said he to the disciple, behold thy mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her unto his his own. Amen. And when I began to read this scripture, amen, I immediately thought about that moment, you know, when you're sitting around and you're hearing a story, right? When someone's telling something that happened, amen, about somebody that you know, amen, somebody that you're familiar with, amen, you begin to go, that sounds just like so-and-so, amen. So when I began to read this scripture, I said, that sounds just like Jesus, amen. So I titled this, Just Like Jesus, amen. Amen. Isn't it just like Jesus to be concerned about the people of God? Amen. To at his most devastating moment, amen, at such physical torment, amen, he was still selfless. Amen. Isn't it interesting that Jesus was still being a savior, a sacrifice, and a son in the middle of his torment and death? Amen. 
You may say to yourself, I get the significance of the Savior, amen. I get the significance of the sacrifice, amen. But why is it significant that he was a son, amen? Isn't it just like Jesus to be a comforter, though, a provider, a way maker, amen, a need meter, amen? He knew that in the biblical times, amen, that his mother would need someone to take care of her when he passed on, amen, amen? For it is said to be understood that the Joseph, amen, his father, her husband, has died, amen? So she needed someone to take care of her, amen? So he stepped in, amen, to provide for her. Isn't it just like Jesus to stop and give you that personal attention in the middle of the chaos and the calamity? What are you saying, Reverend? Isn't it just like Jesus, amen, to step aside of everything he's got to do, amen? Isn't it just like Jesus to step in right on time, amen? Isn't it just like Jesus that when it gets hot up in there, you don't come smelling like smoke, amen? Isn't it just like Jesus? I began to further think about Jesus, and I thought, isn't it just like Jesus that after, and I, I, and I wanted to be very clear about what I was saying, that even after he left his throne, amen, you understand, the moment that he left heaven to come down to earth, amen, after he had an earthly birth, amen, suffered and died in the flesh and rose again, amen, you would think that that moment when he had the opportunity to ascend into heaven, amen, that he would be like, I'm out. No, 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 no. He says, I'm not done here, amen. He says, no, 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 because I am reminded that even in heaven, he's still working to bring us peace, amen. And I know this because Romans 8 and 34 says this to me. Who is he that condemneth? It is Christ that died, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even at the right hand of God and also making intercessions for you, for us. Amen. Isn't it just like Jesus, amen, to continue his walk of Savior, amen? Isn't it just like Jesus to always have you on his mind, amen? Isn't it just like Jesus? The scripture says that when Jesus saw his mother, so it says to me that he was actually still in a servant's mind while suffering. Oh, my God. How many of us are able to stay in a servant's mind while we're suffering? Amen. No, we're not nailed to a tree. Amen. Like our Savior did. Amen. But we suffer in today. Amen. While we suffer with things in our mind and our hearts and our flesh. Amen. I think about Job. Amen. But while we suffer, are we still in a servant's mind? Mm. He was still watchful of the people and making provision for them. And I want you to stay there with that word provision because that's exactly what's happening here. He's making provision, amen, isn't it? Just like Jesus to constantly make provisions for his father's people. He came as the perfect lamb, as a provision to sin, amen, that we selfishly commit daily. He died as a sacrifice to be a provision to death that we deserve. We deserve to die. But it was his blood that ran down Calvary, amen, that keeps us covered from the crown of our head, amen, to the soles of our feet, amen. He died as a sacrifice to the provision of death. Isn't it just like Jesus, that even after he goes down into the pits of hell, amen, to make a provision for the past, amen, for those that had already died, amen, he went back and he says, let me give you another shot, amen. He says, let me cover you with my blood, amen. Isn't that just like Jesus to come and get you from your sin? He even rose from the dead on the third day to leave a present time provision, the Holy Spirit, amen, to guide us. But isn't it just like Jesus to still be a provision of the future? How many of you know that you serve a God who's so amazing, amen, who's so much bigger than you get him, give credit for, amen, so much more than the box that you put him in, amen, that he's thinking of your past, your present, and he's moving for your future, amen. He knew 
that the future would need a way to be saved, comforted, and molded. So he made a provision for his word to be printed and published out of the na- out to the nations to send to pastors, preachers, teachers, and believers, amen, in every tongue, amen, and who were not scared to spread the gospel. Isn't it just like Jesus to meet you in your need, amen? If you don't understand my spoken language English, amen, he says, I'm going to give it to you in Spanish, amen. And if you don't understand Spanish, amen, he says, I'm going to give it to you in Hebrew, amen. And if you don't read Hebrew, amen, I'm going to give it to you in Greek, amen. He says, I am going to feed you and make a provision for you because that's just like Jesus. He would prick the hearts of those sitting at his feet as Mary and the beloved disciple were and charged them with keeping each other and one another in and of Christ. I don't know about you, but today I receive that charge. Amen. I want to be just like Jesus to endure the hardship to walk through my trials, amen, to endure the tribulations of this world, and as my character and belief be publicly crucified by unbelievers, I want to still have a servant's heart, amen, and a mind for those who are in need of the provision, amen, while I suffer, to boldly offer the provision of his death and to guide them to eternal life. So I offer Jesus to you today, just like Jesus, when he spoke in Matthew 11, 28 through 30. He says, come unto me, all ye that are labor and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. (laughs) For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light, amen. And just like Jesus, amen, I want us to know that we have a Savior who's waiting for us, amen. I want you to know that if you're watching this tonight, amen, I want you to know that if you're searching for a Savior, amen, it's just like Jesus to say, come on to me, amen. Receive me, amen. He says, because I am ready to receive you, amen. Isn't it just like Jesus to be the awesome, awesome God in our life? Isn't it just like Jesus? Be blessed. Jesus. 
Jesus, 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 oh Jesus, Jesus, my my burden bear, Jesus, He's my heaven Lord Jesus, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, call him in the morning, Jesus, 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 noon or midnight hour, Jesus, 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 my, my Jesus, Jesus, nobody could do it. coming from my brothers and sisters in the ministry. I encourage you right now in, in, the, in the chat box of this video to type the word hallelujah and thank you God for the messages and the lessons that we've received on tonight. My name is Casey Bethel, the youth minister, and it is my task to bring the next word of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ from the cross. And that word comes from Matthew chapter 27 in verse 46. And it says, at about the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? I got the task tonight to try to put this verse in a way that makes sense for all of us. And as I spent some time studying this verse this week, I realized that there's enough chalk in this verse that we could preach and teach for weeks. There's enough chalk in this one verse of the Bible that if we really study it and apply it to our lives, it can lead us for the rest of our days. But I see there's three points tonight that I'm going to try to share with you. Uh, and, and as we talk about this verse tonight, we're going to talk about it in the way that I think we can apply it to our lives and make our life on this earth better. What should we be doing differently after looking at what Jesus chose to say at this moment while hanging on the cross? Before I show you those three verses, i got to put this verse in context. i got to take what Jesus said and help it to make sense to you first so you understand the time and the place in which he said it. Because when I just read it and say, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? It sounds like something light. But if we delve into what was really happening at that moment, 
you will see why that verse is so important. It says that at this moment, Jesus Christ had been hung, hanging on the cross for hours. This same Jesus Christ had, had already been mocked and made fun of, had been beaten and bruised, had already had the, the crown of thorns pressed on his head till the blood ran down his face. This same Jesus had already had the nails pressed through his hands and his feet. Listen, I, when I was a kid, I made the mistake of stepping on a nail in the backyard one time, and that's a pain and an experience that I've never forgotten. Just stepping on a nail. Well, Jesus, our Lord and Savior, had nails pressed through his hands and his feet. And yet he hadn't cried yet. After being beaten and punched and bruised and, and, and a crown of thorns pressed on his head and seeing his own blood drip down into his own face and the nails in his arm and in his hands and his feet, he didn't cry then. He didn't cry from the pain. But he cried at this moment. And we have to ask ourselves why. Another thing is, at this point, Jesus had already, we, we've learned tonight especially, that Jesus had already used his words to forgive the people who crucified him, had already used his words to promise heaven to the beggar who was crucified beside him, had already used his words to take care of his mom and his disciples, but this was the first time he cried. He cried out for himself. And sometimes I just wonder what that, I wish I was there so I could hear what that cry actually sounded like. It didn't sound like, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken? No, it probably sounded like, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's the context of the words that we're reading tonight. It also tells us in the verse just above that for three hours before Jesus said this, the sun had set in the middle of the day and there was darkness around him. So the first point for tonight is that we see the Father's presence in context. The Father's presence in context. The thing that hurt Jesus the most in his crucifixion was the abandonment that he felt at this moment. It wasn't the nails in his hands and the nails in his feet. It wasn't the mocking and the beating and the bruising. It wasn't the crown of thorns on his head. It was his father turning his back on him. That darkness is represented, uh, representative of the fact that he could not feel his father's presence during that time. And it was at that time he chose to cry, God, why have you forsaken me? So for me and for you living this Christian life here on earth, what should we do differently? We should take the Father's presence much more seriously. How many times have you gone days without reading your scripture? How many times have you glossed over or speed past one of your prayers? How many times have you missed the opportunity to come to church? How many times have we taken the Father's presence much too lightly? One of the big lessons we can take from this experience from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is that God's presence is what matters above all else. We see the Father's presence in context. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? So then we have to ask ourselves, why would God the Father turn his back on Jesus? Why did that have to happen? Now, we know from the preaching and teaching tonight that everything had to unfold in the way that it unfolded so that the outcome could be what God had promised way before. But why would God have, have turned his back on, on his son? The second point we see is the purchase of his crucifixion. The purchase of his crucifixion. See, the reason why God had to turn his back on Jesus was because Jesus had taken the sins of all mankind on himself. The sins of the people who lived before him. The sins of the people who lived after him. My sins, your sins, and all of our sins were on Jesus. It says that he died once for all. And what we know is that darkness and light cannot coexist. That hot and cold cannot coexist. That the father and sin cannot coexist. So while that sin lay upon his son, God had to turn his back on Jesus. But we ought to be that much more thankful 
that Jesus was willing to go through that for us. See, all, to, all this evening we've been talking about the words that Jesus did say. We can celebrate right here in the words that he didn't say. He didn't say, I changed my mind. He didn't say, I quit, let me down off here. He stayed up there in his moment of great agony and abandonment, carrying our sins on his person because he knew that's what to happen. That's what had to happen for you to be forgiven, for me to be forgiven, for us to have the possibility of forgiveness and salvation. So if you're listening to this tonight and you haven't accepted salvation, right now can be your moment to accept the free gift. But for those of us who are saved, let us treat our salvation like the gift that it is. And do not take it too lightly. That salvation that I have was purchased with a huge price. And we see that huge price right here through the tears of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And then the third point, the final point, for my part at least, is an encouragement to all of us. Why would God, turn, why would God the Father turn his back on Jesus? It's because he knew the end. We see his perfect conclusion. He didn't turn his back on Jesus because he was worried about what would happen. He knew exactly what would happen, that he had to do that in order for Jesus to die, to go down to hell, defeat sin, and rise again one day. On Resurrection Sunday, see, he couldn't have the glory of resurrection without the agony of death and separation. God knew the end even before the beginning. And for me and you, as we live this life that we live, certainly sometimes we go through difficult moments, and you and I can feel like God's presence is hard to feel. We can't see him, we can't hear him, we can't feel him. And we yell out, God, why have you forsaken me? But the beauty is, he doesn't forsake us. He's always there with us. And even when he does allow me and you to go through difficult times, he does that because he knows the end. That it's through your difficult times that you can grow. It is through your difficult times that you can succeed. It's through your difficult times that you can become better. And that all of us will come out of our challenges much better than we've gone in. We see the Father's perfect conclusion. Sometimes when God takes a step back, it's because he needs you to go through it so that you can learn. So when we feel that abandonment, our encouragement is to be like Jesus. Don't quit. Don't get down. Don't change your mind. Instead, stay the course. Press on. Do what you've promised. And God will take care of the rest. John 19, 28th verse. I have the pleasure of doing the fifth word. I thirst. You'll find these words at John chapter 19, beginning at the 28th verse. Later knowing that everything had now been finished so that the scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus said, I am thirsty. Verse 29 says, a jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked the sponge in it, but the sponge was on a stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it up to Jesus' lips. The brief time is ours, I wanna just speak upon this simple thought, I thirst. The reality of it is, brothers and sisters, we've all felt this moment or felt this expressiveness of what it is that Jesus says, which is thirstiness. Thirstiness that has either come in a spiritual form or even came in a physical form, regardless of whatever it has been on a hot summer day, or even if it is in this moment that you've been yearning after the word of God, we've all felt the moment of spiritual thirstiness. I mean, think about it. We haven't been able to get to church in the past year. Reality of it is that there's some people who are not content with contemporary at home worship, but they are thirsting and they are yearning after something to drink, not something that can be attained in an H2O bottle, but they are trying to reach something that is somewhat, as Jesus describes to the woman at the well, as living water. What's interesting is that Jesus in this context of scripture is being beaten, is being battered, is being bloodshed for all of humanity, all of those that have been not only a part of the people of Israel, but just humanity in itself to lay down his life for us. He's being beaten, he's being battered, and he's being bloodshed for us, but yet he still acknowledges his humanity. In the midst of this moment, even in his divinity, he still acknowledges the distraction that he's having. That's what I want to say today, that even that we are 
having this encounter with the divine creator, he still has a desire. He has a desire that needs to be fulfilled, not so much in not just a physical drink of water, but in a physical aspect. What's interesting is that even in his acknowledging of his thirstiness, he shows us something that I believe that we can gain on today. That if it is that we acknowledge it, God will give it to us. See how he says in this moment of scripture, he says, I am thirsty. No one else tells him that he's thirsty. As a matter of fact, before it is he encounters this drink, they ask him if it is that he wants some wine and myrrh before it is that he approaches Golgotha's hill. And he says, no, I don't want that bitter cup. Can you believe in this moment, though, he accepts and acknowledge the fact that he is thirsty. People of God, what's interesting about this text, what's interesting about this moment is that he acknowledges what it is that he's fizzing phys physically. What I want to tell somebody for your own sanity, for your own self-care, you have to acknowledge how you feel. If it is that you are thirsty, if it is that you are disappointed, it's okay to acknowledge it. It's okay to say, listen, I need help because at the end of the day, Jesus understood in this moment there's no way that i can cater to the people who are thirsty if i've never been thirsty myself there's no way that i can cater to a need if i never had a need to be met there's no way that i can cater to a sickness if i never had someone in my family that needed to be sick god had a way of acknowledging this present moment so that we could have some sort of relatability as a matter of fact even in hebrews chapter 4 Beginning at verse 13, he says to us, nothing in all of creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Can you believe he says that in Hebrews 4.13? It says that because it tells us in a moment and in the twinkling of an eye, just this short passage of scripture that God sees and God knows how it is that we feel, even when it is that we feel as if he doesn't. Another passage of scripture that may gain us clarity for us to know that God relates with us and even our troubles and our, our suffering it says here in Isaiah 53 verse three, he says he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering, a familiar pain, like one of the people who hide their faces was despised. We held him in low self-esteem. Jesus, in a way, not only just was despised and rejected, but he understood what it meant like to suffer. In this moment, he's thirsty. He's, his body is dehydrated. Can you believe he's suffering and he feels the same moment in which we feel? Suffering. If it is that you cannot say, I'm not thirsty, Taylor, but I can tell you that you have had to survive some amount of suffering. And the reason why you have been able to survive that amount of suffering is because Jesus bared it for you. This was not just the first moment of him catering to a need because in the total sufficiency of him giving his life for us, we have now the right to the tree of life. But outside of that, he showed us what it meant to have an earthly need and for it to be catered to and how it feels for us to have a desire or need that needs to be met. Not only does Jesus show us something that is so imperative in accepting this, this cup of his thirstiness, but he also shows us something that we ought to gain from this to not only accept but we must also acknowledge, acknowledge the fact that Jesus Christ is a Lord Jesus Christ. And he is the author and finisher of our faith. As we find out in this text, we find out that here it is. He says that he's thirsty. But what's interesting within him acknowledging this moment, he shows us a couple chapters before in John chapter four, where it is that there was a woman at Jacob's well. And this woman is there at Jacob's well. And can you believe that something happens and she's offering him a drink of water and she's trying to find it. But he's telling her, listen, I don't want the water from the well, but I'm trying to provide you something that will make sure that water or the well never runs dry. Can I tell you today that the greatest thing that we could ever have is Jesus, because if it is that we have Jesus, that allows us to know that the well, the dryness, the thirstiness that we may be experiencing, whether it be spiritually, whether it be metaphysically, whether it even be Physically, God can cater to that spiritual need because why he's inside of us. And if it is that he's inside of us, he's felt the very urgency, the very, very sense of awareness to reach the need that we need to be catered to. 
It is my prayer that we find out through Jesus's acceptance, through Jesus's acknowledgement that we have been acquitted by his blood. Can you believe that as the scripture continues to continue on after it is that they tell us that he is thirsty? The Bible tells us that they take somewhat of a sponge. As I did my research, the Bible said that they um, acquainted this as a holy sponge in which they saturated it. And not only just vinegar, but the Bible says that it wasn't vinegar, but it may have been even described as sour wine. Can you believe that they do this? They take this sponge and even in the midst of him having to take this sour vinegar, he makes sure that even though we have to have a sour moment, the sweetness of it will continue to live on. Sour Patch Kids says, says it like this. Uh, they have a, a mantra for their brand and it's sour, sweet, gone. I want to say that that's what Jesus left as an impetration for us is that it was sour for him to drink in that moment of thirstiness. But the sweetness of our salvation will give us a resting place for eternal salvation. I want to assure you today that although you may be thirsty, although you may be facing agony, facing whatever it is that you're facing. I it is now about the sixth hour. Our Lord and Savior has been agonizing on the cross. The sun has refused to shine. Even nature knows that something is dreadfully wrong. Our Lord and Savior can barely catch his breath. The weight of his body has caused his organs to begin to shut down. This is a day that we celebrate, but this was a torturous event. His mother was there. The women disciples were there. John was there. And in the sixth word, Jesus said, when Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. It is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost. Now, this is the sixth word. It's still gloomy, but victory has just been declared. It is finished, our words of victory. But they weren't shouted with a parade. They weren't shouted with celebration. They were shouted from a man that had been tortured and could barely speak. It is finished. In the Greek, it is tetalistar, meaning that it is finished. The debt has been paid. It is closed out. The closer in any situation is the one who comes to finish the job. If you go to sports, if you're a baseball fan, and the, your winning team and they're ready to shut down the other team, they bring out the closing pitcher. And so they back up the outfield, but the closer is not letting anything come across the plate. Strike one. Strike two, strike three, and it's out. It's done. Well, in the military, the closer, when they go back and bring in the seals, they bring in the most technical. That's the group you don't even see them coming, but you only see the evidence that they were there. They close it out. Jesus said to the disciples, we are going to go to Jerusalem. See, they really heard the words that Jesus was saying, but they did not understand the full meaning. He said, we're going to Jerusalem, and all things that have been spoken in prophecy will be fulfilled by the Son of Man. You would think that when they offered Jesus something to drink, 
it would not have been sour vinegar. Sour vinegar was a very cheap wine with a street drug induced into it. You would have thought that because he was the king of king, they would have brought out the best they had, but they were still trying to make Jesus insignificant and common. But in the sixth hour, when he said, it is finished, it was our victory. Because Isaiah just told us that this wasn't about Jesus. This was about mankind. This was about the Father loving us so much that he packed his only begotten son, sent him down through 43 generations to get to earth, to walk on the earth 33 years. But what it was really about at this moment was he was pierced because of our transgressions. He was crushed because of our iniquities, and the, our peace was upon him. And by his stripes, we are now healed. What that really means is every lie that we've told, every time that we have taken something, every time that we have bared fault witness, every time that we've committed adultery, every time that we have not operated in kindness, Every time that we have forgotten the grace and the mercy that has been stole, bestowed upon us. Jesus showed us all through the story how to die and how to live because he's the finisher. Well, let's look back. Come here. Let me share his best friend's story. Lazarus. Lazarus was a friend of Jesus. He was a friend of Martha and Mary. And the word got to Jesus that Lazarus was ill. And Jesus said, I will be there, but I can't come right now. Well, you remember Martha. She's a bit uh, uh, beside herself at times. And before Jesus waited four days to make the journey, because he knows that he is the finisher. But Martha was so upset with Jesus that she met him coming down the road. She said, Master, where were you? If you had been here, my brother would not have died. They they went on down the road. They got to Mary. Mary was so distraught. The, she was still crying. The moaners were still there. She was so hurt and distraught that Jesus even wept. But he said, this is not how the story is going to end. I told you that this illness was merely he's asleep. And so Mary said... Martha said, I know that we'll see him again when he is resurrected. He said, but I am the life and the resurrection. I have walked into this situation. So you will be able to yet see how the story is going to end. He said, tell me where you laid him. They go out to the tomb. It's in a cave. There's a stone in front of it. He said, move the stone. They said, but he is already smelling. He said, move the stone. When the stone was moved, he said, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus got up, shook off the grave clothes. And then Jesus said, it's finished. Jesus is the ultimate finisher. Well, we go back and we look at the woman with the issue of blood. For 12 years, she had been pressing her way. She had been to doctor, to specialist. She had been everywhere trying to seek a remedy for this issue of blood. She felt dejected. She couldn't go to the sanctuary. You know how sometimes church folk can be. When one person doesn't look like you or act like you or dress like you, we kind of push them to the back. So because of this issue of blood, she couldn't go to the sun. She couldn't even touch anybody. So she felt cut off from God and from man. But because of her faith, 
She said, if I can just get to Jesus, I don't even have to touch him if I can just touch the hem of his garment. So she pressed her way. She took a risk. She put her faith in front of her fear, and she took a risk. She touched the hem of of his garment. Immediately, Jesus said, who touched me? The disciples said, Jesus, don't you see all these people out here? What do you mean? Who touched you? He said, but power just left me. The woman fell down at his feet and she said, master, it was I. He said, because of your faith, you are now made whole because it is now finished you are now made whole so she no longer has to keep them doctor's appointment she no longer has to not go to the sanctuary she no longer can has to be away from family and friends well, the last one we want to just look at that Jesus showed us how to live as well as how to die is a Samaritan woman. Now, this woman wasn't dealing with a physical affliction. She was dealing with a mental affliction. When Jesus met the Samaritan woman, that was an oddity all by itself because Jews didn't even talk to Samarians, let known to a Samaritan woman. She was looking at Jesus like, what is really happening here? I know you're not asking me for a drink of water because she was at the well in the middle of the day, in the heat of the day, because she could not go to the well early in the morning, in the cool of the morning, because she was so ridiculed. The women were gossiping about her. You know she's got five husbands, and the one she's living with now is not even her own. We forget how our words can be so damaging. We forget how when we don't offer love to people, how it can be so hurtful. We forget how we murder folks without ever laying a hand on them. But when she met Jesus, she met a man that could tell her all about her situation. And by the time that conversation was finished, she said, oh, let me tell you, I met a man. And the whole community was saved because Jesus finished the conversation. He finished her depression. He finished her anxiety. No more trips to the psychologist. No more needing therapy. We're going to lift up her self-esteem. We're going to make her feel like somebody because when you meet Jesus, you are no longer the same. Well, you think that Jesus said it is finished because Jesus knew he had bled and died for a people who were had sin, that continued to sin, and in the future, they would be sinning. Because he was the finisher, because he said it is finished, you and I now are reconnected to the Father. When we close our eyes on this side and we open our eyes on the other side, we are connected back to the Father. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more fear. All we have to do is just walk around heaven all day and praise the Lord. It is finished because we are covered in the blood of Christ, it is finished. Amen, amen, amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Praise the Lord, everybody. I, I don't know about you, but it, it, it's been kind of hard sitting right there and, 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 and not being able to, 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 to move and, and just do the things you want to do because I've truly been blessed today. I have the privilege of bringing the last word. And it is the seventh last word and it comes from Luke 23 46 and it says father into thy hands I commit my spirit Jesus called out with a loud voice saying father into your hands I commit my spirit and when he had said this he breathed his last there were seven recorded utterances of the Lord Jesus 
just before he died. As you already know, the number seven is the number that indicates perfection. But the number seven is also the number of rest in a finished work. God created the heavens and the earth and in the six days and he rested on the seventh. Today we will look at the seventh saying of the Lord Jesus indicating that he rested in his finished work on the cross. The task the father had given him was now complete and he rested and put his spirit in the father's hand. Let's take a look at the seven things that occurred at the time Jesus died. The first, according to Luke, darkness came over the land for three hours. The second one was the temple curtain was torn into two. Third, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Fourth, Jesus died willingly. Fifth, the satyrian declared Jesus to be innocent. Sixth, the people who came to see the spectacle became to drift away. Luke says some of them even beat their breasts, which was a sign of guilt and shame. And seventh and last, our Lord's friends watched him from a distance. You see, Jesus called out with a loud voice, For into thy hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he gave it up. Notice with this loud voice, scarcely one would expect from a man about to die. But Jesus seemed determined that his final words be heard. His words are firm and confidence. Let's examine three aspects of the seventh word. Here's the first aspect. Jesus' seventh word was a word of faith. These words are from the psalm written by David. Into your hands I commit my spirit. Redeem me, O Lord, O God of truth. You see, these words are also part of an evening prayer used daily by devout Jews. Jesus died with the words of scripture upon his lips, believing promises of God. And he lets go of his life to Jesus, to God, who entrusts his internal destiny to the Father's everlasting arms. Here's the seventh, second seventh word. It was a word of fellowship. You see, Jesus' first word upon the cross was Father. Father, forgive them for they know not what they are doing. And now his last word is to the Father. Father, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. But between the first and the last word that he hung on the cross for hours. Now all of this is done. He said it is finished. The cup of God's wrath is now drained. The darkness is over. Father, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. The seventh word of the cross shows Jesus now having fellowship again with the Father. The, the Savior is once again in communion with the Father. He can now speak to the Father because the Father is no more removed from him. You see, he now can make intersections for us. You see, Jesus went from my God, my God, but now once again, he can now address him as my Father. Here's the last point. Jesus' seven word is a word of fulfillment. You see, first, it had to be fulfilled from the Old Testament that an animal must be brought for sacrifice. The final sacrifice to which the Old Testament pointed out was that someone had to come who was without spot or blemish. But he also had to be offered voluntarily. You see, second, this word is a word of fulfillment because Jesus himself predicted that his life would not be taken from him, but that he would give it willingly. You see, John 10, 11 says, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. John 10, 15 says, as the father knoweth me, and so knoweth I, the father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. You see, John 10, 17 says, therefore doth my father love me, because I lay down my life that I might take it up again. John 10, 18 says, no man take it from me, but I lay it down of myself. 
I have power to lay it down and I have power to take it up again. This commandment that I received of my father. You see, they tried to beat it out of him, but no man could take it from him. They tried to torture him, but no man could take it from him. They tried to crucify him, but no man could take it from him. You see, as Jesus hung on the Christ, as he hung on the cross in tremendous anguish and pain, and as he died peacefully as the most medicated person in the most advanced hospital of modern time. You see, he died in peace. You see, he exalted his spirit and refused to inhale his next breath. You see, when Jesus said it was finished, that's exactly what he said it was finished. You see, I'm about to close, but if I may, I, I want to take you back to that day. It was said that the cross that Jesus had to carry weighed over 300 pounds. Can, can you imagine as he took the cross and as he walked down the road and as he had people spit on him and talk about him and as the Bible says he took 39 lashes and on the end of the whip that was shot teeth, that was metal, that was steel and as that whip hipped him over the back, it ripped his skin. He did all of this for you as he got to the land of the skull and as they put him up on the cross and as he laid his arms out wide, the soldier hit him once here. The soldier hit him once there. The Bible says that his legs were broken. He did all of this for you. My God, my God. The father had to turn his back on the only son that he knew. All for us because he could not see his son. You see, God did it all. He gave his only begotten son. And as I close, I just want you to know that you've never at a point that God would not forgive you. You're never at a point where you've stooped so low that God would never reach down and pull you out of where you are. I want you to know that wherever you are, you may not have walked the way you wanted to walk. You may not have talked the way that you wanted to talk. But I come to tell you in the midst of where you're at, that's why he died. All you have to do is say, God, please forgive me. All you have to do is say, God, I need you. God, I, I repent of everything that I have done. I believe that you died on the cross for all my sins. You see, ladies and gentlemen, salvation is free. It doesn't cost you a thing. The only thing it costs you is just to believe. It's just that simple. So if you would, say this simple prayer with me. God, oh, Heavenly Father, I realize and recognize that you died on the cross for all my sins. God, I'm a sinner, and I need you in my life. God, please forgive me for all the wrong that I have done. And God, I promise from this day forth to live the way that you have commanded me to live. Bless you. It's just that easy. It is just that easy. And so if you have said that simple prayer with me, my Bible tells me that you're on your way to where he is because you will see him again. And so as I close, the seven words that were given, another way that it was given traditionally, these seven sayings are, number one, call forgiveness. Number two, salvation. Number three, relationship. Number four, abandonment. Number five, distress. Number six, triumphant. And last but not least, reunion. And I just come to tell you that those who die in Christ, we will see him again. Those who die in Christ, you will see your loved one again. Those who die in Christ will rise up and be with the master. Family, I hope that you have been blessed because I have. May God bless you. May God keep you is our prayer. Amen. Amen.